Hi everyone. Today I want to show you how to use protocol buffers in the web. I'm going to be designing a key value store application that uses protocol buffers and web sockets to communicate between client and server. It'll be really simple. The server will have a get method and a set method. The get method will take in a key and return the value associated with that key. And the set method will take in a key and a value and simply set the key equal to that value. So let's dive right in. Since we're using protocol buffers and web sockets, we're going to be using JavaScript for the front end and we're going to use Go for the server. There are some things we'll need to install in order to follow along with the tutorial, so I'll link those in the description below. All right, let's get started. All right, so I've opened up an empty directory. I'm going to just first make a folder where I'll store all the protocol buffer files, and let's go in there. I'm going to make a new file which will store the protocol buffer API for our service. Uh, I'll just call this service.proto. All right, now in here, I'll add the syntax line. I'll declare the package to be service, and now we can define our API. So I'm going to have a message set request, which takes in a key and a value. We'll also have a get request, which takes in a key and nothing else. We'll make the set response. So when the server receives a request to set a key equal to a value, it will simply return nothing. So we'll leave this empty. We'll also make the get response. Now technically, the get response only needs to contain the value. But to make things easier, we're going to return the key and the value. It's possible that if the client issues two GET requests in a very short time span, the GET responses might uh, get reordered or delayed. So by including the key, we make sure that the client can uniquely identify which uh, GET request their GET response is associated with. So in this tutorial, I'm not actually going to use gRPC. I'm only going to use protocol buffers, which simply provide a way to serialize data into binary. So protocol buffers will provide an API that allows me to serialize these messages into strings of bytes. And it's up to me how to send those bytes. I can do it using gRPC which is a very common choice. I could use it, uh, I could send data using HTTP or WebSockets. And in this tutorial, I'll use WebSockets. You could just as well use any other protocol of your choice. The nice thing about web WebSockets is that they work well on the web and they also allow you to do streaming. So whereas in typical HTTP, the server can only respond to the client when the client sends a request. When you use WebSockets, there's a persistent connection between the client and the server. So the server can send data to the client even if the client does not explicitly ask for data. Since our data is going to be serialized as a string of bytes, the server won't be able to just look at the bytes and tell, is this a set request or a get request? And so to make, make sure that the server can easily understand these messages, I'm going to wrap both the set request and get request in another message. So whenever the server sees a string of bytes, it can assume that the message is of this wrapper message type. So let's see how that looks. I'm going to make a message called request, and I'm going to use something called a one-off field. A one-off field simply allows you to specify one field, one of many fields. So whenever you create a one-off field, you will be able to specify one, but not all, of the field wrapped inside this one of block. So if I create a set request, set request, and I can also create a get request, like so. So now, if you try to set the set request, it will override anything you put in the get request, and vice versa. So only one of these fields can be set at a time. Notice that you still need to give one of fields their own unique field descriptors, even though they're wrapped inside this one of block. You also don't need to give a field descriptor to the rec field. Let's do the same thing for the response. So message response. It'll have a one of response, and this can be either a set response or it can be a get response. Cool. Since I'm using protocol buffers instead of gRPC, there's no point in defining a service since there's no point in generating a gRPC service that we're not even going to use. So I won't bother to define a service. However, for our conceptual understanding, you can think of the service as being a simple RPC that takes in a request and returns a response. All right, now that we've written our protocol buffer files, we need to generate the code. I'm going to go into my previous directory, and let's make two folders where we'll put the client and server implementations. In this video, I'm only going to implement the server. I'll implement the client in the next video. So let's cd into the server. And I'm going to be using Go version 1.14.3. If you have an older version of Go installed in your computer, you may need to upgrade your version of Go to follow along exactly. Also, if you don't have Go installed, there's a link in the description to install Go. Now, Go uses something called modules or packages. And so to set up a package for this server project, I'm going to type go mod init and the name of our package. In this case, I'll call it simply server. And you can see that this has created a new file called go.mod. And if you look inside it, it basically just declares that our module is called server. Now, if you were generating a real application, you would want to provide a unique package name. For example, if you own a domain name, you might use your domain name slash your project name as the module for your project. This prevents conflicts if you try to import other modules with the same name. Now that we've gotten that set up, let's actually generate the protocol buffer files. To do that, I'm just going to write a simple bash script. The bash script will be, will be very simple. It will just invoke the protocol buffer compiler. The input directory will be the protos folder that we wrote earlier. Now we want to generate Go code. So we'll say go out equals server slash service. 
This will just put the output in a folder called server slash service. And the protocol buffer file we want to compile is called service.proto. Note that I don't have to say proto slash service.proto since I specified the input directory to be protos. Cool. Now let's save this. Now you'll see that if I try to run the bash file, I'll get permission denied. This is because you usually need to mark the file as executable. So to do that, I'll type chmod, which uh, says to change the permissions on the file. I'll give it the plus x, which stands for add executable permissions, and I'll type in the name of the file. Now if I ls, you'll see it's turned red. Turned red. This just indicates it's an executable. Now I can do dot slash gen dot s. So it looks like I've used the numbered one twice in the same message. So let me just fix that. Here it is. Let's change this to two. And now we should be good. Let's run the executable again. We need to make the directory first. So let's do mkdir server slash service. And let's try again. Cool. Now it should have worked. Also note that the dot slash in front of the gen.sh is necessary. If you simply try to do gen.sh, it'll say command not found because it can't find the gen.sh executable in your path. So you need to do dot slash gen.sh. Now if I see me into server and go into service, you'll see that there's a file called service.pb.go. And if I look inside it, it contains all the requests and responses that we wrote in our protocol buffer file. Great. Now let's actually write the server. I'm going to make a new file called main.go. And you'll see that my vim go extension has already populated some basic information, such as the package, and added an import, and written the main function. For my WebSocket implementation, I'm going to be using this library from GitHub, uh, Gorilla WebSockets. It's a version of Go that implements WebSockets, and it's pretty easy to get set up. If you want some examples, you can click on one of these links to see how the author sets up the WebSockets. All right, now I'll get started setting up the WebSockets. I'll speed up this part of the video since it's not too hard to find examples online, and it's not too interesting. So I'll be back when that's done. So in our main method, we'll first define a port that we want to listen on. And the address we want to listen on will just be localhost. So let's just do a format.sprintf localhost uh, MD and give it the port. Let's also print out the port we're listening on, just so we can see when our server starts. Now I'm going to use the Go HTTP library to set up a web server. The handle func function takes in a path that you want to listen on, in this case just slash or the root path, and a function that you want to be called whenever someone makes a request to that path. So in this case, I'll just uh, make a new function called handle request. And let's write that function now. The handling function takes in a, an HTTP writer, so we'll call this whttp.writer, and, and the it also takes in an HTTP request. Now the way WebSockets work is that they're built on HTTP. So the initial communication between the client and server is with HTTP. The client sends a header indicating to the server that it wants to upgrade the connection to use WebSockets. If the server acknowledges that uh, connection upgrade, then the connection begins to use the WebSocket protocol rather than HTTP. In order to upgrade, the WebSocket library we're using requires you to create an upgrader object. Creating the upgrader object is as simple as just declaring it. However, there's one slight issue, which is a security issue, and that is that the WebSocket library will reject connections, uh, will reject most connections if you don't explicitly tell it which origins to allow. The reason why it does this is a little bit more complicated than I'll explain in this video, but the point is that we need to explicitly configure the WebSocket library to allow connections from any client. Note that if you're actually deploying this on the web, we want to be much more careful and make sure you're only allowing connections from your own hosts. So to tell the WebSocket library you want, you want to accept connections from anyone, I'm going to write a function called check origin that takes in an HTTP request and simply returns true. So no matter where the connection is from, we will instruct the WebSocket library to accept the connection. Now to specify that to the WebSocket library, I'm just going to add a check origin field and point it to the check origin function, like so. Now let's add some imports that we're missing. So we need to add format, we need to add we also need to add the HTTP library. I'll also add logging. Let's import the generated files, which are in server slash service. The server comes from our Go module. Since we declared our package as just being server, we're looking at the protocol buffer file in server slash service. If you have named your module something else, the type for the slash is whatever your module name is. Let's also import the WebSocket library. That is github.com slash gorilla slash WebSocket. And now you can see that uh, it's still complaining about a few things, but we'll get those fixed shortly. Also, I forgot that this is called an HTTP.response writer. Not just a writer, and this should not be a pointer. Okay, cool, it looks happy now. Now I want to actually upgrade the connection, so I'm going to do that by calling upgrader.upgrade. This requires us to pass in uh, the writer and the request, as well as another parameter, which we'll just leave blank for now. Now this returns a connection, which we'll call C, and error. So let's say those are variables, and then if there's an error, let's just print out a message and exit. So now if we get past this step, we should have an updated WebSocket connection. Now it's best practice to always close the connection once you're done with it. So we'll use uh, Go's defer construct and call c.close. The defer uh, syntax just means that anytime this function exits, 
it will always close the connection before exiting. So if you have a return statement, your function will return, but before it does so, it will call any statements that you've deferred. Now that we have a WebSocket connection, I essentially just want to listen in an infinite loop for any requests that come along the connection. So I'm going to do that using an infinite for loop, which is just a for loop with no condition specified. So we'll put a for loop here, and we'll try to read a message from the connection. So we'll call c.readMessage. This returns a message type, message, and error. I'll explain what each of these means shortly, but for now, let's just check if the error is not equal to nil. And if it is, we'll just crash. Not that you want to actually want to crash your program if there's an error reading the message. You just want to log an error message and decode the connection. But for now, for debugging, we just want to crash the program and exit with an error message. Now, the message type can be one of two things. The message can either be a text message or a binary message. WebSocket supports both. In our case, we're going to be serializing protocol buffers and sending them along the WebSocket. So we expect to receive a binary message. So let's just throw an error if we receive a non-binary non, uh, type message. We can do that by saying if message type not equal to WebSocket dot binary message. And if this happens, we'll just throw an error and say expected binary message. OK, the next step, once we've received a message, is to actually decode the message and understand what the request is asking. So to do that, I'm going to declare a variable called rec for request and set it equal to an empty uh, request object from our protocol buffer file. This just allocates like the memory for storing the request, and we'll now unmarshal the message based on the bytes we've written. So the message variable we have now contains the bytes that the client sent us. So we want to be able to decode this into a protocol buffer object. In order to do that, I need to import the protocol buffer library. So I'm going to import github.com slash golang slash protobuf slash proto. Now I can use the protocol buffer unmarshal function to decode the request. So I can do that by saying proto.unmarshal with the data and the request object. Essentially, this just says, take the bytes from the message we received and try to deserialize that into the request object. Now, this will store the result in request and return an error if there was anything wrong. So we want to check if error was nil. So we can do that by saying if error and error is not equal to nil, then we can say that there was an error. We'll just say error unmarshaling proto, and we'll print out the error. Right, now our request should be populated with whatever request the client sent us. So we want to uh, break into two cases. One case is if we receive a get request, and the other case is if we receive a set request. So let's do that now. The way Go handles one of is a little bit verbose, but we'll get through it. The way we access the type of the of the one of field by using a switch statement. So we can switch on request dot request, which is the name of the field dot type, which allows us to switch based on what type of request we received. So let's inside the switch block, we'll handle a few cases. The first case is if we get a set request. The way we can check if we received a set request by doing a protocol buffer uh, file dot request underscore set request. The name of the message is the first part before the underscore, and the name of the field, in this case set request, is the part after the underscore. So in this case, we received a set request, and we'll handle it. But for now, let's also check the other case. The other case is if we receive a get request. So if we receive a pd dot request underscore get request, now we know we have to handle a get request. The last option is if neither field was set, in which case we should get a nil. In, which, in this case, we'll just log an error and say we received unknown request type. And before we continue with this, let's actually write down the functionality we want to provide. So I'm going to write a function called do set, which takes in a set request and returns a response, set response. We'll implement this in a second. Let's also write a stub for do get, which will take in a get request, get request, and return a get response. Let's also make a global variable. We'll call it our KV store, which will be just a map from strings to strings. And we'll set this equal, we'll make a new map, so make map string string. This is how you can initialize a map in Go. All right, the set method is, these two methods should be fairly straightforward. So let's just print out the log so we can see what's going on. So we'll say set uh, key equal value and give the actual value. So in this case, request.key and request.value. This way the server will print out what it's doing so we can see what's going on in case we need to debug later. Now let's actually set the value in the map. So kv store request.key equals request.value. And then let's return a response. Remember that our set response was empty, so we don't actually need to return anything inside the code bases. OK, for our get function, uh, we'll say, for the get function, let's first try to access what's in the map. So Go provides a nice way of checking whether something is actually in a map. The way we do that is by saying uh, value, comma, present, equals a kv store, with, and parameterize it with the rec, and we give it the rec.key. What this says is, if the key is actually in the map, then it will set present to true and set value to the value from the map. Otherwise, it will set present to false. 
So let's check for that. So if not present, let's just uh, print an error and crash. Of course, in every operation, you won't want to do this, but this is just for example. Uh, key not found, and we'll print out the value of the key. Otherwise, we can package up the key and the value in a protocol buffer uh, get response. So we'll give it the key, which is just the request.key and the value. Uh, one thing I forgot to do is to actually set up the server to listen, so let's do that by doing log.fatal f uh, and http.listen and serve. HTTP listen and serve should never exit unless your program encounters an error. So this will do is we'll just listen, uh, and if there's an error, it'll return and the error will get printed out. This way we know if an error happens. Now let me just compile the program to figure out what it's containing. Okay, so we should actually return pointers, not the actual objects, so let's fix that. These should be pointers. All right, now it's happy. Okay, so let's get back to uh, actually handling the request. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, set the set response equal to the output of do set, and I'll give it the set request that was coming in on this request. The way I can access the set request is by doing request dot get set request, like so. And now let's package that up in a response. So we can uh, say, <clears throat> let's make another variable outside the switch block, uh, response, and this will be a pointer to a p dot response. Now to package up the response, we can just do res equals uh, and pb dot response. Now the way Go handles uh, one of is again kind of funky. The way you have to specify the output is by doing and pb dot res underscore set request. Res underscore set response. Sorry, like so. Now again, the way Go handles one of is kind of funky. But what you have to do is you say res is equal to a pb dot response underscore set response. Like so and the set response finally is the value we got, set does. So kind of funky, but you have to wrap your messages uh, like so. So this part is the uh, name of your message, response, and set response is the name of the field inside the one of. Note that this is not res, this is not the name of the one of field, this is the name of the entire message. All right, let's do the same thing for the get request. So we can say get response is equal to the output of do get request dot get get request. And we'll package up the response like so. All right, now it's complaining. Now those complaining are going to capitalize these, so I'm going to do that real quick. Okay, excellent. It's also complaining about res because I'm not actually using it, but we'll do that shortly. Okay, now we've calculated the response we want to send back to the client. And we now need to just serialize the response back to bytes and send it along the WebSocket. So let's do that. Just like we did before, instead of unmarshaling the protocol buffer, I'm going to actually marshal it, which will take a protocol buffer message and output a set of bytes. So let's say the data and error is equal to proto.marshal, and we'll pass in our response. Now, if uh, we got an error, let's just uh, print and exit. Now let's actually send our data. Uh, we can do that by typing c.write message. Uh, and the first expects the message type. Again, this can be either a binary message or a text message. But in this case, we're sending an array of bytes. So let's do websocket.binary message. And then we'll give it our data. And we'll check if there was an error. If there was an error, let's again print and exit. All right, and there we have it. This is a web server that will perform uh, get and set operation. Now, we haven't tested this yet, so I can't say if it will work or not. Uh, there are always possible bugs that are looking underneath the covers, but we'll do that in the next episode. In the next episode, we'll also implement a JavaScript client and have a talk to the server, and we'll make sure that the server is actually working. All right, that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.